Hello, everybody. Welcome to another episode of the This Week in Science podcast broadcast. We are here as we are every Wednesday, and Justin is not going to be joining us this evening as he's not doing well. But as I love to remind you before every episode, hit the likes, hit the subscribes, do all those things. This is just the live recording. And if Blair and I make mistakes, which we never do, it's always... <laughs> always the internet. It's always technical stuff. It's not us at all. Um, but if there are ever any errors, then hopefully those are taken out in the podcast version and you can subscribe to the podcasts and all that kind of stuff. You ready, Blair? Oh, look, yes. she's yawning. She's like so I can't, excited. I can't help it. I'm so, so excited. Ex I'm like, I need more oxygen to fuel the science that's coming. Let's do it. No, you don't. You know what? No, I'm going to stand. I'm going to stand up for part of this. Oh, my. You better because there's kicking involved if you're sitting. Right? There's yeah, kicking involved no matter what these days. But... <laughs> now we have the, the desk is moving and the, the standing is happening. So I'm going to wait. I'm knocking things over. <laughs> it's all good. This I haven't stood is... in a couple months at this desk. This... This is live, everybody. This is what happens. Okay. All right. Here we go. I stood. I'm standing. <laughs> I've stood. I'm definitely going to sit later, but I'm standing for now. Good. Okay. All the th all these things are good. They're you hear that? Good. I'm winded. This is great. All right. Let's go. <laughs> I wasn't going to talk about the uh, the aging mice study. Hypoxia. Apparently, it's good oh, for no. aging. But uh, let's. Yeah, let's do this show. So I'm going to get this started. Ooh, starting the show in three, two. This is Twist. This Week in Science, episode number 927, recorded on Wednesday, May 24th, 2023. How did we get here? I might not have all the answers, but I am Dr. Kiki, and thank you for joining us for another evening of This Week in Science. Tonight, we will fill your heads with spiders, Saturn, and solar flares. But first, disclaimer, disclaimer, disclaimer. Some days, you just pick your head up and look around and wonder to yourself how you got where you are. Is this the place you meant to be? Really? And does it really matter? You are here. Well, choices, luck, in ignorance, knowledge, there's lots of ingredients that go into that magic soup. Sometimes it involves solar flares, and sometimes it is just This Week in Science coming up next. I've got the kind of mind that can't get enough. I want to learn everything. I want to fill it all up with new discoveries that happen every day of the week. There's only one place to go to find the knowledge I seek. I want to know. Oh, and a good science to you too, Blair, and everyone out there. Welcome to another episode of This Week in Science. We are so glad that you all joined us for this episode of Science. You know, we like to talk about science every week, and I hope that you like to be a part of that. Thank you for being here. Thank you. I hope you're doing well. All right, today, what do we have? I have science news, news stories about life vibrations for brains, and Saturn. What do you have for us, Blair, in the animal corner? I have spiders. I have more spiders. I have uh, frog sperm, and I also have, what was the last one? Oh, yeah, din dinosaur eyes and bird brains. It's a whole thing. I thought you were going to say more spiders. No, just the two spiders this week. Just two. Okay. Hopefully only, that's enough. Only two spiders. That's all. It's enough for Blair. It's enough for me. But if you're all excited about these stories and the one, other ones that we didn't even mention, because of course there's going to be more that comes up, you never know what's going to happen here. I would love to remind you before we jump into the show that you can subscribe to Twists 
all places that podcasts are found and that we broadcast on YouTube, Facebook, and Twitch weekly on Wednesdays at 8 p.m. Pacific time. And additionally, you can find us on social media. Look for This Week in Science or at Twist Science. We're at Twist Science on Twitch also, by the way. But if you want show notes and audio files and all that kind of stuff, you can find all sorts of information at our website, twist.org. Okay, let's jump on in. What? Would the earth be without the sun? Cold and dead? Pretty much. Okay. The, <laughs> the, not just the cold part, but the dead part, especially. Yeah. Um, new research that was published this last week in the journal Life. An article called Formation of Amino Acids and Carboxylic Acids in Weekly Reducing Planetary Atmospheres by Solar Energetic Particles from the Young Sun was published and the basic gist of the whole study is that solar flares and really energetic solar flares were really important to sparking life on the early earth which means that additionally maybe mars was another spot where life was started because we know from lots of experiments and we've talked many many times about uh early life experiments where uh just from electrical stimulation and a few basic ingredients, we've been able to start to form amino acids and some of the basic building blocks of life. And we've found building blocks of life all over the place. And it just gets, the story has gotten more and more and more concrete that life should be starting everywhere. But what is yes. the thing that really starts it, right? What really gets it going? And this particular study uh, really took the age of the sun into account and the activity of the sun into account. And so nowadays we might be afraid of the occasional solar storm and the possibility of solar flares that could, eh, you know, electromagnetically wipe out our electrical grid or affect our satellites for communication. But uh, once upon a time, our sun was a lot more active. It was like a hyperactive little tantrumy child. <laughs> sure. Yes. And because of that, uh, the interactions of the super flares that we've really never even uh, encountered during our, our time here on Earth or what we've been existing in recently, uh, that this cosmic radiation from our sun would have sparked reactions within the atmosphere and within various uh, components of the Earth itself to create plasma and to create amino acids, carboxylic acids, and would have been better than just lightning on its own or galactic cosmic rays. So just our sun by itself being a tantrumy youngster um, might have led to the biomolecules that made life possible. I love that. I think everything we know about thermodynamics tells us that energy is important and 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 that it fuels a lot of things uh, in life and the universe and and that we know that a lot of um, chemical reactions that it takes to to make life happen require energy input, right? So um, it I guess, yeah, that makes sense to me. It follows, that, right? It, it follows, but I think the one thing that is uh, kind of shocking to people thinking about how the sun might have been um, involved in it is that uh, the sun used to be, when the earth was very young, a lot dimmer, about 30% mm -hmm. dimmer. But even though it was very dim, it had these massive eruptions. Right. And it was though the energetic particles that would come in the electromagnetic storm that would come as a result of these super flares that were probably at least once a week. Not like, oh, once every several years, once a week. Yeah. That's, that, mm -hmm. 
Well, and I guess that also helps to explain going. why life isn't happening literally everywhere that there is a star that's a good distance, right? So if you need if you need this kind of secret ingredient that is the the secret spice of the of the solar flare, then you need it at the right distance and the right heat and the right intervals and like all these specific Goldilocksy things that make life happen. So that that helps explain why it's not happening everywhere all the time, I guess. Not everywhere all the time and why like our sun isn't destroying us constantly right. now. <laughs> <Yes>. <laughs> Thank you. You're Thank right. you, soul. But it also does give us that perspective on other planetary systems, other yeah. solar systems that yeah. might be younger than ours and what might be happening there. And those mm -hmm. that are older than ours, or, you know, that life cycle, we now mm -hmm. have maybe something that's a little bit, uh, you know, gives us some more ideas that we can use for comparison. And gives us places to look. Where are there stars that are having periodic solar flares close together that might help? spark life let's go look let's go look for all of those stormy solar Whoa! flares look at that go oh my gosh life that's it a firework if i've ever seen one that's right thank you son thank you for being quieter now thank you for being very active once yes. upon a time yes what did you want to talk about next oh okay um let's talk about spiders and um, right into the spiders okay yeah well just i have i have an interesting angle on this study so this is a study on funnel web spiders which um sydney funnel web spiders are extremely venomous they're super dangerous the development of antivenom um is the main focus on this species so almost all research done on funnel web spiders it's looking at antivenom which is good. I'm not complaining about that at all, because if I ever go to Australia, there are so many things that could kill me, and I appreciate antivenoms for as many as possible. So, that being said, though, they're not being studied for much else. Oh, wow. Uh, and so there's a lot of kind of gaps in our knowledge of funnel web spiders. So the other issue is that funnel web spiders, as the name suggests, live in funnels. And so yes. there's, it's also kind of obscured and difficult to study them naturally in the wild. So this because is Because they live at the bottom of a funnel. And yes, they like, exactly. They come out to attack things. Yes, yes, precisely. So this was a study looking at courtship behavior and mating systems in the Sydney funnel web spider. Sydney funnel web spider. And um, there were a lot of kind of guesses based on the anatomy of these animals. And uh, they found some things they were expecting and some things they weren't. So they knew that there's kind of a display that happens outside of a female burrow, because again, that's something that you can watch pretty easily in the wild. Videos have been collected a lot to describe the male and the female kind of behaviors that happen outside. And then now they've collected videos for what's happening inside their burrows in a lab. So they had um, mating pairs filmed in 451 videos to create 165 minutes of footage in total. So they were able to really see what these guys were up to during courtship and mating. Um, and so after they have this kind of elaborate display and the female welcomes them in or concedes or whatever you want to call it, um, they, they found some, um, some kind of lifting behavior, which is really interesting. And uh, in the end, some of the males would be chased away. And so based on that information, the initial guess was that the males were lifting up the females to keep them from eating them. <laughs> so basically, so the female could not attack, kill, or eat the males, which is a very common story in spider mating, right? <laughs> So they're yeah. basically like, oh, can't get me, can't get me, can't get me. So they have these can't clasping spurs. The oh males have these um, these clasping spurs on their second pair of legs that is used for lifting the females. So after watching these videos initially and seeing that a couple ran away, they're like, oh, that's what it's for. But as they continued to study their videos, they found that 
the spurs are actually used to pull the female toward the male and keep them there. It's just, it's just a handle. It's really just a handle. And this is really collective function. And they didn't see any cannibalism happening between these spiders or any reason to believe that that might be happening in the wild. So, um, so these very venomous spiders yes. that are very poison, like dangerous spiders to humans, they're not attacking each other. They're, they're like, Hey, yeah, we're in, we're, we're together. Come into Let's my go. funnel. Come on in. Yeah. I invite then you, you can in. leave though. When, when we're done, you can leave anyway. Um, <laughs> I'm only going to hold on to you while you're here. Yeah. Uh, but so this is interesting because we're looking at an animal that's difficult to study in the wild. There are a lot of guesses made on, on the fact that these are a dangerous spider to humans. I think that definitely colored the conversation a little bit. And that coupled with the fact that a lot of spiders are cannibalistic in mating. So they kind of put two and two together with these spurs and kind of made this guess which there's nothing wrong with that that's how a lot of zoology started is observational based on characteristics they that's how originally animals were lumped together before we learned about genetics so all this kind of stuff right so that's a place to start but i think this is a great example of using that kind of evidence to make a hypothesis and then be able to test it in a lab and be able to actually see oh nope it's used for something else entirely I totally understand why they made that guess, but I like that these extremely venomous, scary, dangerous spiders are actually not so bad to each other. And from what it looks like, uh, that maybe the attacking of mates isn't, you know, it's not widespread and maybe it's simply just, uh, you know, evolution moving a particular direction for different species, right? And that in this particular case you have two similarly sized very uh mm -hmm. you know venomous creatures that maybe they don't need to do that maybe they because of the size or there there might be all sorts of reasons why it doesn't work out in that direction yeah yeah but their hypothesis was wrong yeah they're not yeah. so bad the funnel web spiders unless you're a human or any other animal being bitten by them then seek, seek some anti-venom, please. <laughs> Call, go to the hospital. Seek, seek medical help as soon as possible. Yeah. yeah. Stay away from funnels in Australia. That would be my suggestion. These are some of the most venomous <laughs> spiders in the world. Yeah. Right? Yeah. Most dangerous. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oh, awesome. Great. So they brought a bunch into a lab. What could go wrong? I am uh, inspired by those scientists who... <laughs> <laughs> wanted to work with these spiders. Oh, man. That's wild. It's like, bye, dear. Hope to see you at the end of the day. <laughs> Unless I accidentally get bit by a funnel web, then see you never. I'm sure they have anti-venom. Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Available. Sure. I'm sure they've got something. Yeah. Oh, my goodness. Well, something that's equally deadly, but not something that you find at the bottom of a funnel or a web. Um, Saturn. I mean, it's deadly to us. You can't, we can't go there <laughs> ourselves. What are you afraid of? Um, there's no, there's no anti venom for Saturn. <laughs> Saturn. Nope, not happening. Okay. Um, so this week, a couple of studies came out that were related to Saturn that I thought were very exciting. Researchers uh, talked about uh, their work with the James Webb Space Telescope, looking at uh, Enceladus, which we know has plumes of what we think is water, vapor, and uh, James Webb's telescope, according to researchers that reported at a conference at the Space Telescope Science Institute in Baltimore on May 17th, that there's massive plumes and James Webb saw them all. So this isn't the first time, but this is like the highest resolution that we've been able to see these plumes with. And uh, the, the jets of vapor, they say, shoot further into space than they previously realized, uh, further than the diameter of Enceladus itself. So it's, there's so much pressure. It's just spewing this vapor out into space. Um, their material is part of the forming of one of Saturn's rings. 
So these vapory blasts causing ice particles actually lead to the formation of one of the rings of Saturn, which is also very exciting. Analysis suggests that the jets contain methane, carbon dioxide, and ammonia, which are all organic molecules. These are necessary for life. One of the hypotheses is that beneath the icy surface of Enceladus, there may be um, oceans of methane and these organic liquid molecules that could be harboring bacterial life. Um, but we don't know that for sure because we have to go there and we have to see that for sure. But um, it's a very exciting idea. And now maybe there's more evidence from the James Webb Space Telescope that will push us into exploring Enceladus even further. You got any pretty pictures of that? Pretty Oh yeah, last thing that you're talking you, about. You got a pretty picture. Well, the the pictures from the James Webb uh, still need to be analyzed, and the paper oh, needs to be come out. But needs to come out. But there are, yes, some gorgeous pictures of these jets shooting out from the surface of Enceladus. Oh. Um, yeah, there are part of that pictures. early reporting from from NASA we were talking right. about before. Last come on, time. don't tell me what. The James Webb saw without some pictures. Give me the pictures first. <laughs> I want to see them. You're a camera, right? Isn't that your whole deal? Give me some pics. It's the whole deal. Um, <laughs> additionally, not related to uh, the James Webb Space Telescope, but uh, we've we all know the Cassini mission that spent years studying the rings of Saturn, studying Saturn itself, and taking uh, just some beautiful, beautiful looks at the, the rings and this incredible planet. Um, well, we kind of take these rings for granted, right? It's these rings of Saturn. We look at them and we go, wow, it must have been there. And they've formed over such massive time periods. And we think of our solar system as this kind of stable thing. But New research that has been published this last week based on some of the last data available from NASA's Cassini mission um, suggests, based on theoretical models, that these rings are really only a few hundred million years old. So younger than the Earth, younger than the moon, probably we're getting their start sometime in the time of the dinosaurs. Okay, so let me ask this question. If I was on a planet far enough away and I had a telescope where I could see Saturn, I would see it without rings. Yes. Yep. Yes. Yep. Exactly. Very cool. Or if I had a spaceship that traveled fast enough, I could yes. look back. You could look back. And see no rings. Yes. <laughs> Right? That's wild. It's really wild. And other uh, other ideas that come from this data and this work suggests that maybe the other massive gas planets in our solar system, which also have rings, by the way, we just can't see them very well, that maybe their rings were bigger and more prominent at one point in time before we started really looking. Sure. So they're like, I wore rings before it was cool. I wore rings. I just thought, you know, I've been getting rid of them. It's okay. It's fine. Um, so the models, based on what they got from the Cassini data, it demonstrates that the rings are actually losing mass onto the planet. So that there's, you know, we talk about meteors hitting our planet every once in a while, but basically those rings are just like being pulled in by Saturn's massive gravitational pull and there there's meteorites constantly falling and falling and falling and falling in from the rings and the rate of stuff that's falling suggests that they're really only going to be around for a few hundred million years from oh. now so well before our sun decides to expand and destroy us all saturn will have rings that we can't really see anymore huh which is so fascinating we're so puny and small we mean nothing <laughs> just think we're such a little blip 
And the even our own solar system has such a history on either side of us. It's wild. Right? That someday, yeah, we, we're just lucky to be seeing what we're seeing at all. Yeah. Yep. How'd we get here? Thanks, solar flares. Who knows what's going to happen next? I don't know. We don't know. We're, we'll see what we'll see where it goes. Do you want to tell me about uh, frog sperm? Yeah, of course. Does that sound like Does it sound like an, a very like natural segue from Yeah, rings from, of Saturn? from yeah. the rings of Saturn to frog sperm? It's all eternal. Anyway, um, now this is a real quick story that just um, it's a, it's from University of Newcastle and it's a breakthrough in cryopreservation of amphibian sperm, which. I think everybody listening is acutely aware at this point that amphibians are not doing great. Um, they are very sensitive to changes in water quality and uh, changes in temperature and all sorts, you know, new fungus introduced to the water and all sorts of things. Amphibians are called indicator speedy species because they are so sensitive that they're a useful tool when kind of checking on the health of an environment. They're usually one of the first things to be impacted. Um, but so because of that, oh, there's a lot of conservation efforts to raise amphibians in a controlled setting and then release them when they're adults into the wild. So they have a head start. A lot of uh, programs are working on inoculating them against chytrid fungus and other things in the environment so they have a better chance of survival. And remember, they also have important ecosystem services because what do they eat? Bugs like mosquitoes. So all that to say, Yay, this is this is this is why we care about amphibian sperm because there's breeding efforts that happen in captivity to help continue these amphibian populations that are in trouble. But um, I wasn't aware of this. The methods are imperfect, and I think about like human fertility and how eggs can be frozen and sperm can be frozen and all these things, and it sounds like it all just works. And I just kind of had the assumption that it works and we got it and we figured it out and we can freeze sperm and it's not a big deal. But um, this recent research found a superior method of freezing and thawing frog sperm, which had improved sperm quality as a result. They found that using less sucrose or sugar in the freezing process, which who knew sugar was involved, but it is, facilitates higher cell recovery, resulting in more intact membranes and, and better sperm motility which produces, of course, better swimmers, which produces more viable offspring. So they tested sperm from six frog species. In all cases, the new preferred thawing method was superior than the traditional cryopreservation method. So um, pretty straightforward study. They just tried a new way to freeze sperm. It worked really well. It, this could have a huge impact for amphibian conservation. So good job. It's kind of interesting you know, specifically considering that they're amphibians and they lay their eggs and they release their sperm usually in a watery environment. So perhaps that's some part of why the difference in freezing, like less sugar yeah. makes why it makes the difference. Yes. Um, yeah. I would imagine that a pond is very different from um, a reproductive canal <laughs> in terms of many things, pH, I, sugar, lots of other things. Yep. So, yeah. <laughs> At least I hope so. <laughs> it's very different. Uh, yeah. Uh, but yes, sucrose is used very often for cell preservation, for sperm preservation, because yeah. when you freeze stuff, if you don't do it in the right way, and they use sugar very often because what it does is it creates a different uh, diffusion gradient so that mm. the cells, as they freeze, the water molecules don't get spiky and make ice shards yes. that shatter the membranes. That makes sense. Oh yeah. man, that totally makes sense. Which yeah. also, since you brought up the fact that a lot of them are broadcast spawners and they're just spawning generally in the environment, also some of them live in ponds that freeze. So, yes. so they're maybe probably there is, more tolerant. Yeah. Their it's cells very, might be more tolerant. Yeah. 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 That's really and, interesting. Yeah. Think about that. And mixing it up with the sugar is probably mixing up the metabolism of the cells, messing with actually the like how the molecules are working. And yeah. yeah. Interesting. But uh, yeah, I'd love to see how this translates to other amphibious species and maybe either uh, other 
cold water dwelling species yes. fish and yeah yeah i wonder i don't know speaking of cold uh the montreal protocol has been doing its job uh do you know what the montreal protocol is blair no i don't recall it sounds familiar yes well we like to think of it as the uh, agreement that or global treaty that decided everyone around the world basically decided to reduce uh, ozone that we put into products or the CFCs that we put into the products CFCs. that, oh, that okay. cause yeah. ozone. So it was the ozone protecting protocol. And uh, according to, this was about 1987 when the treaty was signed, and we've heard, you hear every year, oh, the, the ozone hole, it's opening, or it's closing, it's getting smaller, uh, and you think of it in terms of sunburns and cancer, but right. it also has climate impacts because it is, the ozone layer is part of the atmosphere, and a new study that was led by researchers at Columbia Engineering, the University of Exeter, has shown that the treaty has slowed down the effects of climate change on sea ice in the Arctic by as much mm -hmm. as 15 years. That's so great. the appearance of the first ice-free Arctic summer uh, is, it would have been earlier, but we got rid of those ozone-causing pollutants in the atmosphere at least not got rid of but we minimized it and that was something we did together yeah globally so in terms of solutions communications this i think is one of those stories a global community not a global community the global community came yeah. together made an agreement we stuck to it and we have had an impact we can do more yeah, I think about the the CFC ban all the time in relation to kind of how how much traction was made over such a short amount of time um, versus how slow kind of the fossil fa fossil fuel phase out is going, and it's it's proof that we can do it for sure. But I think it's a lot of it was something that we discovered quickly wasn't being used in that many things. They were being used in very specific items. Um, mm -hmm. that their replacements for very easy, not that fiscally impactful replacements for the CFCs. Nobody really noticed when you stopped putting it in uh, hairspray, hairspray, for example, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> there are other aerosols you can use. Um, and so I think that it was, it was a pretty easy switch and replace. Um, not to say that it's not important. It's a very important thing that happened and it proves that we can do these sorts of things, but it definitely was a lot less complicated than trying to, unentangle ourselves from fossil fuels which Certainly. is in everything that's a much bigger no, bigger task for sure yeah. yeah yeah but i i think it's these kinds of agreements where it's evidence that the global community can come together and do things that are successful and have mm -hmm. impacts and so we need to remember that it's a big task but bit by bit yeah little bit by little bit well, and we're making we're making huge yeah. strides. It's happening. Yeah. I mean, it's I, I went to a webinar a couple of weeks ago of like, let's talk about what's actually working in in climate change. And I was really surprised. You don't hear the success stories, but um, what was it? Electric car purchases are up 10 times in the last five years, I think. One in every seven cars bought currently is an electric, electric car. Yes. Amazing. You don't hear these things, right? No. Like huge yeah. numbers of um, of houses are being built with heat pumps instead of air conditioners, which work just as well, if not better, and don't use fossil fuels. Like there's all of these things that are happening that we don't talk about and we don't stop to celebrate successes, even though that's what can encourage further change. <laughs> so, yeah. Let's celebrate the successes. I think yes. that will help us remember that we have... The power. Like you're that ozone layer. Like we like saved you. We saved you. We're gonna save more things. Yeah. We'll do it. I don't know. We're helping um wombats? No. What's the New Zealand species that we've been helping cure their cancer? But anyway. Tasmanian devils. Tasmanian devils. We've been helping with that. We can do that. We've been working on things. Yeah. 
Yeah, we fix stuff. It's good. This is This Week in Science. Thank you for joining us for another fun-filled episode. We hope you're enjoying the show. And if you are, please share it with a friend right now. Right now. Text a friend. Call a friend. Be like, look at this show. You should watch it. You should listen to it. Subscribe. Do that. That would be very, very helpful. And if uh, you really love the show and you want to help do help us do what we do every week, head over to twist.org. Click on our Patreon link and become a supporter. Every month, uh, you can support us at your the amount of your choosing. $10 and more. We will thank you by name at the end of the show. $15 and more. You'll get a sticker every once in a while. There's stickers. Come on, everyone. Help us out. We can't do this without you. Thank you for your support. And now that I've thanked you and we're coming back into the show, I think it's time for Blair's Animal Corner with Blair. She loves our creatures, great as all. Biped, milliped, no pet at all. If you want to hear about animals, she's your girl. Except for giant pandas and squirrels. And a What you got, Blair? I have a study about dinosaurs. Or Dead more animals. specifically, <laughs> it's actually about alligators and ostriches. But they have decided, researchers have decided, this study on alligators and ostriches tell us about dinosaurs. Okay. So it's, in my opinion, I don't want to color people's opinion before this even starts. It feels like a little bit of a far walk, but we're going to take this walk together and we can discuss if this sounds correct. <laughs> we will so, discuss. Uh, a study from Lund University in Sweden. They were looking at um, visual perspective taking in animals. So that's a skill that usually evolves, or sorry, emerges in um, in humans around age two. But um, this is the idea when when someone near you turns their head towards something in their environment, you follow their gaze. But specifically. The more advanced behavior is when you follow someone's gaze to a location that is initially obstructed. So like if I'm in this room and Brian's outside the door and he looks towards our front door, then I would walk around the corner and look at the front door. I would be able to understand he is looking in that direction. Let me go see what he's looking at. That is visual perspective taking. So that means I can put myself right. in his shoes and figure out what he's looking at. Right. So, and that's without having to like do a bunch of double checking over and over and over of what do you, what's, what's your deal? Oh, let me stand exactly where you are and look at what you're looking at. No, I can understand based on where I am and where you are, what you're looking at. So that's visual perspective taking. This has been observed mostly in mammals, some birds and reptiles. Um, and this kind of, very specific tracking of where a person's looking is mostly attributed to apes, monkeys, and ravens specifically. So they wanted to see when this started happening, because as this stuff often does, it was attributed to humans and other apes. It's like, it's a very sophisticated thing that's happening. And so the more you look, you see other animals that do this. And so they wanted to see when this behavior emerged. So they used a comparison of alligators with the most primitive existing birds, paleonaths. Those are ostriches, emus, rheas, and one of my favorite types of birds, tinamus, which tinamus. I will suggest everyone looks it up. Tinamus, they're little, they're little cartoon birds. There's really no other way to describe it. They look like little little loafs with bird heads. Anyway, what? they run around on the ground. They are technically flighted, but they're flighted like a chicken is flighted. They're not super great at flying, um, but they are flighted as compared to ostriches, emus, and rheas, which don't even have flight muscles at all. So they wanted to see the neuroanatomy, or specifically, they, they looked at neuroanatomy of these two groups because they're 
pretty similar. So basically the idea is crocodilians and birds and their common ancestor, which was a dinosaur, they all kind of have the same brain because their neuroanatomy is similar. So if you see similar behaviors in these individuals, chances are they're based in similar neuroanatomy, which means they're based. Yes. So it's already, you see where I'm getting with this is like a little bit of a leap. Um, But so they're comparing ostriches, emus, and rias, these paleonaths, to their uh, their forebears that had similar brains, which are velociraptors and similar. <laughs> okay. So they wanted to compare these two groups, which creates a bracket around an extinct lineage of dinosaurs, which leads yes. up to modern birds. So basically, either they share this behavior and a common ancestor had it, or they do not share this behavior and therefore a common ancestor did not have it. So here's where, in my opinion, this study kind of takes a turn. So <laughs> uh, evolutionary psychology behavior stuff yeah. is always a bit yeah. tricky, but you yes. can't test it. So it's, it's anyway. Um, so the alligators didn't demonstrate their visual perspective taking in their tests. Okay. So they're a little out group, a little further, further right. removed from right. the velociraptor group of, from which birds are derived. Right. Yeah. Every bird species they test exhibited visual perspective taking. Also, these birds engaged in a behavior called checking back, which is where when they look somewhere, then they look back at the individual's eyes and then retract the gaze, kind of understand like, I'm looking at what he's looking at, right? <laughs> and previously that's only been seen in humans, apes, monkeys, and ravens. And so based on all this information, uh, when paleonath birds emerged 110 million years ago, they're saying that that's when this behavior emerged. And so that means it predates primates and dogs who have been doing this behavior by 60 million years. Looking at the neuroanatomical sim- uh, anatomical similarities between these birds and their non-avian forebears... They say, quote, it is plausible that the skill originated even earlier in dinosaur lineage. However, it is less likely to have been present among the earliest dinosaurs, which had more alligator-like brains. So this is where this study loses me because just because ostriches, rias, and tinamus all can do this (laughs) does not mean that their common ancestor definitely did it. Um, It's a behavior. It's a behavior. Yeah. I mean, I get what they're getting at, but you can't test it. But also my dear researchers, what about (laughs) convergent evolution? This does not have to be a common trait that dates back to dinosaurs because mammals have this and birds have this. Therefore, the common ancestor with mammals and birds, but not with crocodiles, have this. That is not necessarily the case. Like, all these animals are social. All these animals require interaction with other individuals. This could be something that has popped up a million times. They all have eyeballs. The eyeballs are the <laughs> convergent, or, or sorry, are the common the evolutionary common trait. trait. Yeah. They all have vision. These animals all have vision. So, like, they have vision. And they have a social structure. Therefore, at some point, it's evolutionarily beneficial to be able to pay attention to what my friend's looking at. In no way to me does this mean that this is something that was evolutionarily conserved for 110 million years. I think what you're getting at with the sociality is the most (sighs) important aspect of that. Is like once you are cooperating or working with other individuals. You need to know what they're looking at if, or, I mean, even there's even a certain aspect of, uh, predation that, okay, maybe they, the alligators, they tested, that wasn't the group, but looking at what other species in your ecosystem are looking at and knowing when there's a threat, when there's not a threat, maybe it's, you know, I don't know. There's a lot of stuff in there that is not necessarily well, being taken into account. And that's exactly it, right? Crocodilians mm. are they're they're not pack hunters. And they they're ambush climb trees. predators. <laughs> they can climb trees as we've learned. 
But yeah. they're ambush predators. So they don't need, they don't care what anyone else is looking at. They're waiting for their food to practically touch their nose. Right. But wolves, right. where dogs come from, are pack hunters who hunt by sight and smell. Um, and so not only do they cooperate in their hunting, but they are they need to be able to track moving prey. Yeah. All of the birds that we talked about are lunch. So it's really important for them to be able to see if somebody else noticed a predator. Exactly. So like the crocodilians are also just a really weird choice because they have such a different behavior set. Anyway. Hey, this is, this is all over the internet. I saw this posted yeah. maybe six times this week. Dinosaurs are better than dogs at tracking it's understanding well, we perspectives. It's we have no idea. This is an interesting study. It's a great comparison. Love their approach. But, yeah. but we don't know. Yeah. And maybe yeah. some dinosaurs, yes. Other dinosaurs, no. I I love you know, convergent evolution, adaptation yeah. based on need. Yeah. It's, I don't know. Did, did velociraptors do this? Maybe. Probably. They did, to our knowledge, pack hunt, right? So, yeah. like, sounds good. Probably. Did T Rex do it? Probably not because they were it, largely scavengers. <laughs> so, right. their stuff isn't moving, it's dead already. <laughs> you know, uh, I will and say they were big. There wasn't a lot for them to worry about. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> exactly. Out of the way. My, 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 I do have um, a quote from the senior author, Professor Matthias Osvath. It's a really good quote, which I will, I agree with mostly. <clears throat> Early in my career, crow birds earned the nickname feathered apes due to numerous research findings that showcase their remarkable cognition. However, I'm beginning to question whether it'd be more fitting to consider primates as honorary birds. Oh, you're muted. I said, I like that. Yes. I said, are you a bird? Well, I mean, really, we're all reptiles. So Yes. That's where it goes back to. I mean, we're all fish if you want to go well, that far back. Truth. So truth. It's, it's a whole thing. It is. Um, anyway, one is an ant, a plant. Oh, and one is a, an ant that is a plant, actually a spider. What? <laughs> Do tell. Um, I think we've talked before on the show about jumping spiders that look like ants. I think so. Yeah. yeah so they, they like stick up their front legs so they look like antenna and they walk in a very particular way to try to fool potential predators into thinking they're ants. Uh, mimicking ants is a great defense because... Usually they're not very delicious. <laughs> they have spiny defenses. They bite. And a lot of them carry chemical repellents or venom. So if this little jumping spider wants to avoid being eaten by other spiders, looking like an ant can be a really good way to get away with it. But this particular jumping spider, Siller Culling would die, was already known to move like an ant and, and kind of look like an ant. But one thing that was weird about it is it was covered in these really bright colors. And ants aren't these colors. <laughs> They're like red and orange and white and black. They're not pretty, pretty uh, abstract pictures. No. Usually, no. They're no. solid. Ants are usually so, just a solid color, maybe a couple of colors. Why are you moving like an ant and looking like an ant, but colored like I don't know what? Um. So the, they wanted to do some studies to see who they were trying to fool and how with this stuff. From a human's perspective, it looks like they blend well with the plants that are in their environment. But they wanted to test that to see if it actually helped with predators. So they collected wild ant mimicking spiders from four different locations in China and brought them back to the lab. And for comparison, they collected another kind of jumping spider that doesn't mimic ants and five co-occurring ant species so that they could kind of see, like, who do they blend it with? And in the lab, they characterized and compared how the ants and spiders moved in terms of their limbs and their speed and their acceleration and whether they followed a straight path or they took something kind of back and forth. And they found that um, jumping spiders usually jump. 
But these jumping spiders, they didn't. They moved like the ants. They actually did appear to move very ant-like. They bobbed their abdomens. They put their front legs up to look like antenna. They lifted their legs to walk in an ant-like matter. So they even <laughs> like the way they moved their legs were similar to how ants move. They most closely resembled the smaller ant species that are closest to them in size. Because jumping spiders are teeny tiny. Little tiny. Yeah. yeah. So it seems like a really effective one. But they didn't have, they weren't a perfect mimic to any one species. It seemed like they kind of got mostly there to three different species. And so you can see how that could be beneficial because being a general mimic rather than perfectly mimicking one ant species makes it more possible that they could expand their range, that they could go in different habitats, that they could go into different types of environments and still blend in with the other ants where they live. So then they tested their spider, the, the spider's defenses against two of their predators, a similar size jumping spider with color vision that does eat other jumping spiders and a praying mantis. That will eat jumping spiders and ants and anything it can get its little yes. mandibles They'll on. Eat anything. Yes. The other difference is that jumping spiders, as you might guess, because of they're always so colorful and beautiful, usually, they have color vision. And as far as we know, praying mantises have a monochromatic visual system. So that is where this kind of weird coloration comes into play. So they looked at how the predators would see these spiders relative to other spray species. And they put them mm -hmm. against plants as well that the spiders would live on, which include red flowering West Indian jasmine and uh, Fukian tea tree. And they found that the ant mimicking spiders were better camouflaged for both spider and mantis on the jasmine plant. So they do appear to blend in well with a very particular plant where they live. Mm -hmm. But when they were just given us the option to take a spider and, uh, and eat it, and they were like, oh, is it an ant? Is it not an ant? Looks like the predatory spider would attack the non-mimic jumping spider. Out of 17 trials, they launched five attacks all on the non-mimic. But praying mantises, they ate everything. <laughs> The idea there is that praying mantises, as you kind of alluded to, they're huge and they can eat spiny ants. Doesn't bother. Right. So, it, of course, the mimic wouldn't really work for them. But the, the predatory spiders would get injured by a spiky ant. They would avoid those. So it does seem like it's a targeted mimic towards other spiders. They're doing their best. They're... <laughs> They're blending in with a specific plant, and yeah. they are attempting to mimic multiple ant species, which is very cool. So it's a it's a good enough mimicry. Yes. It's a yeah. it's a mimicry that's kind of general, but able yeah. to blend in well enough to not die most of the time. It's evolutionarily <laughs> beneficial, right? Yeah. So, like again, this isn't the end of the evolutionary line. I don't know how many millions of years it's taken them to get here. But in another couple hundred thousand, maybe they'll be better at it, or maybe they'll add something to it that'll help them avoid praying mantises, right? It's just at this point in their evolutionary journey, this is the best model. Or maybe they will uh, speciate. Maybe there will be subspecies. Mm -hmm. Maybe they will specialize depending on how different competition niches work out and predation. Yeah. And, you know, who we don't, we don't know that, but... They've gotten to where they are, which is for now good enough. Yeah. And so I think yeah. the reason I was so interested by this story is that it combined all these different types of, of uh, camouflage. They have, right. they have coloration, they have physical mimicry, and they have locomotor mimicry. So they have like, they're moving in a particular way, they're morphing their body around to a particular shape, and they are trying to blend in with their environment. So Camouflage mimicry on so many levels, it's very cool that they've been able to kind of stack all these things together. It's amazing that they've yeah. been able to stack all. I mean, that's it's a lot. Yep. Right? The 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 probability of all these various things coming together to allow them to to survive and adapt to the you know the conditions that they're in. That's amazing. Yeah. 
please don't eat me. Don't eat me. I would love to know, you know, how widespread these spiders are, how big their populations are. Are mm -hmm. these, you know, are these, are these spiders in a very specialized environment habitat already? Are they in danger? Like usually when you have very specialized organisms, they're going to be less likely to adapt to rapid change. So. Hmm. Great question. Yeah. I wonder. I don't have a range map for them. They're in a, a larger genus that's full of jumping spiders. <laughs> Lots of spiders that jump and they don't. Yeah. Just, and the majority of the genus is the specializes in hunting ants, which is interesting because this right. individual depends on them. Well, if they, they still will, eat them. They probably do. Yeah, they look like them, and then they blend in, and then they eat them. No, <laughs> I survived. No, no one here but you. us ants. <laughs> Don't look at me. I'm just an ant, just oh just hanging out, just like you. So cool. I'm totally just like you. That's all. Oh hmm. my goodness! Wow. Are we all just ants? Mimicking what we can to survive. I don't know. Right? Putting on our colorful our colorful paint and, yeah, moving our, our arms in various ways. I look like an ant. It's great. Don't eat me. Uh, anyway, moving on to some brain stuff. Let's, yeah. Let's get into some brain things. Uh, we've talked previously on the show about something that is a very fascinating concept and we don't really know why it's working the way that it is but there's evidence that a certain uh, frequency of light and also of sound 40 hertz which is also uh, similar to the gamma wave uh, brain signal within our brain 40 hertz frequencies of light and sound have been shown to benefit Alzheimer's, dementia, other uh, diseases of the brain uh, of, related to aging. And so a group out of MIT said, well, let's look at tactile stimulation. And so they took a group of mice that are kind of predisposed to developing Alzheimer's neurodegeneration. It's the tau P301S mouse. It recapitulates the disease's tau pathology where the tau tangles get into the brain and lead to a lot of the symptoms of behavioral change, memory loss, et cetera. And uh, th they vibrated the, they put the mouse cages on speakers they, on top of bass speakers, actually, oh th that were playing a 40 hertz sound. So it's a very okay. low frequency sound when in terms of it's within human hearing but it's a low frequency uh, and the tactile vibration of the speakers bull, vibrating um, actually led to changes in neural activity. The brains of these Alzheimer's mice were uh, less likely to show tau tangle activity. They had uh, increases in various components that are more neuroprotective rather than neurodegenerative. And uh, mice stimulated for three weeks. I mean, could you imagine sitting on a bass speaker for like three weeks? They had preservation of neurons compared to mice that had not been put on speakers for three weeks. So maybe not a speaker, but hear me out. <laughs> what about prescription massage chair right yeah and do you need to be vibrated at 40 hertz consistently for three weeks or is this something that could be on well, and off is it a it's scalable like, thing too because like right is it is it auditory or manual like what is what is what is the impact coming from because the there's the frequency of the vibration, which is physical, and then there's the frequency of the sound that is causing the vibration. Yes, which is auditory. With is which is auditory. Yeah, so and we know that auditory, uh, auditory 
40 hertz stimulation can also be beneficial. So uh, okay. they've controlled for these things. It's just, it was the vibration. So massage chair and headphones is yeah. what it would have to be. <laughs> and maybe a pair of special glasses that okay. sure. blink lights at you. So, so basically I'm just going, I'm going to a sensory deprivation chamber for a while. Just I'll be 40 back. hertz spa. Um, but th this yeah. is my other question is, does it matter that mice hear at different frequencies than humans? And that is an interesting question. And does yes. it matter that they're smaller than us? So the physical Again. vibration would feel different. Like, does it have to be scalable? Like, is it going to have to be a way crazy higher vibration for us? Or is it? Yes. Yeah, I don't know. Right. So many questions. I don't know. And it's. I think it's, you know, this is the beginning of looking into these this fascinating direction for therapeutic, right. non-invasive treatment, right? So we need a like, scaled animal model. We need something larger. Yeah. And is it, you know, is it something that's really going to, you know, it's not going to prevent the disease in the long run, but just if it can uh, ameliorate deterioration, slow things down, help things oh, out yeah, for just huge. a little while, right? It could be, and yes, this is just mice at this point in, in time. So we don't know how this will work on people. I mean, there are people who talk about, you know, the, the harmonics or the, um, the frequencies that are involved in cat purring being therapeutic. So huh. I don't, you know, that's not on your brain. I mean, you put on your cat hat. Yeah. For a while, but my cat sleep in my good. head. <laughs> as long as you don't spook them. Yeah. And then you have claws in your mm -hmm. cranium. There's an eyeball. Yeah. That's no good. <laughs> I don't like it at all. But it's just, yeah, it's it's a fascinating story that I'm surprised to see it continue in this manner. And I'm going to be very interested to see where it goes. Because first it was like, oh, we put this blue light at this, you know, this weird 40 yeah. frequency light, the sound. But I was like, what is going on? And now it's a different modality and if yeah if it can help mm -hmm. ameliorate pathology help behaviors i mean 40 hertz it couldn't hurt that's one of those things <laughs> when you go to like an alternative health spa and they ring a bell and they're like this is going to heal you and you're like no it's not but is this it might <laughs> There might be some science behind it. Who knows? Right. So that's like where <laughs> a lot of these things, they start blending a bit. And it's like, yeah. okay, there is probably some truth to some things, but we just haven't studied it and figured out the mechanisms and we don't understand exactly why. And some of these things right. are actually absolute, you know, bullocks. But, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. you know, it, it's just a matter of... Some are, out. some aren't. Also, like, where did it come from? Was there was this right. something that's that humans did for thousands of years and we stopped doing it and it was working and then we stopped because it was like, what is this? But then they're actually they did it for thousands of years because there was a reason it worked. Let's find out yeah. scientifically why versus I've decided that if I carry this crystal around, I won't get cancer. That's very different. Right. Than something yeah. that's based in kind of more ancient wisdom that might have a reason for having worked in the past. So I don't know. I yeah, I don't know. I like I like reason. That's why I'm here. Um, yeah, but, you know, we can't ever assume that we know everything. I think what is interesting about the 40 hertz signal is that it is the gamma wave uh, of, so it is a brain wave that is part of our of our brain signaling and so that in itself is interesting why is that one working what's the mechanism there um but beyond vibrating at <laughs> 40 hertz uh, -huh. uh researchers at the reinhardt lab in boston Uni university have looked into transcranial alternating current stimulation. So last week we talked, I talked a bit about like using magnets on your brain to treat uh, depression this week. Um, it's not magnets. It's just alternating current on your head. So like if you have ever used like a, a, um, a TINS, a muscle stimulator, they get alternating current to stimulate your muscles, maybe can help with muscle cramps or muscles, uh, uh, strengthening. Um, you can also, people have been using them at particular 
frequencies and in particular locations on their heads to stimulate uh, neural activity within their brains. And it has been shown over time, positive and negative results. I don't know, lots of studies going different directions. So they did a meta study, a meta review of, of a number of one, a number of 100, over 100 published studies, total over of over 2,800 human participants to look and see whether or not this transcranial alternating current stimulation has an impact on cognitive functions, whether it's only for people who are experiencing mental deterioration or mentally challenged in any way, or whether it helps healthy people as well. And really, they found it just works. It helps everybody. Hmm. Um, it's not just helping people who already have uh, disabilities or deficiencies. It's also, uh, it can also enhance cognitive fun function. Uh, it, it does depend on where the electrodes are placed. Uh, they found that a specialized type of this tax can target two brain regions at the same time, manipulating how they communicate with each other. And so that in itself can either enhance or reduce cognitive function because it's affecting how the brain is communicating within itself. Um, but it's definitely a technique that has promise. So yeah, stimulating your brain with electricity. And this might be a really silly question, but how is this different from the electroshock therapy of like the 70s and 80s? So the difference is that the electroshock therapy was much like, you know, it's a, it's higher voltage. It's, um, the electroshock therapy was more focused on the frontal lobe. These, uh -huh. um, the tax stimulation is a lot lower uh, voltage. It's different time frames. So it's like the amount of time that the stimulation is occurring is different. And then also um, uh, where the electrodes are placed is also very impactful. So there so, are so actually the electroshock therapy was like a blunt object kind of like a sledgehammer. Yeah. And now this is like, oh, we're getting into needlework. <laughs> okay, got it. Okay. Thank you. I appreciate the clarification. Cause I was like, I thought we did this and it uh, mixed results. <laughs> right. So yes, mixed results okay. on the, the sledgehammer effect, right? And mixed yeah. results also with this needlework as we get more mm -hmm. and more refined and the resolution is, you know increased and increased and we start getting more specific into what areas of the brain are impacted. Um, but there appears to actually be a moderate improvement, sometimes great improvement, depending on what's happening and who it's happening to and what area of the brain is involved related to working memory, long-term memory, attention, executive control, intelligence, how you interact with the world around you. So, yeah. Yes. Well, I'm, I'm not, I'm not ready to electrify my brain, but. I, this is, it's, yeah, it's not for everyone. <laughs> it's not for most people probably, uh, but it's a, it's interesting. It's probably more so going to be used in a therapeutic nature and that'll, yeah, that's probably where it's going to be seeing the most Great. promise moving into the future. Um, I did want to bring up a couple of uh, cool studies that I didn't put into the notes. Or actually, one specific one that people are talking about um, this week that at first I had been like, oh, whatever. Uh, you know, spinal implant, stimulating the spine, helping people walk. Blah, blah, I did know. see that. But this is really cool, what they're doing. Okay, so researchers have published in Nature this week their work with one individual uh, who's part of a study uh, and how they have created a system that takes the intent of movement from the brain. So they've got cranial implants, cortical implants, that are positioned to read the electrical activity that reads the intent of the individual who was injured, uh, had issues 
had kind of hit a plateau with you know, walking with a walker and and hadn't been able to get to a point where he was able to completely return to normal movement or walking activity. Uh, they put these cortical implants in. They have a backpack, which is like a, they call it a wearable processing unit that receives that data from the brain and then basically as an AI and sends stimulated uh, stimulation through an implantable pulse generator and electrodes that are in the spine below the level mm -hmm. of the injury to move muscles in the legs. And where previously he was unable to move his hip flexor uh, muscles uh, with within a very short period of time after just first getting this system put on, get every, getting over the implantation and getting it moving without a lot of training, he was able to start thinking about moving his hip flexors and his hip flexors were move, moving. Um, he's recovered a lot of, uh, of his independent activity, able to walk without a walker, is able to uh, move, you know, still with, there's a lot of difficulty involved, but in the years that he has been using this, it has led to recovery that is beyond just using the stimulator. So his, his body is starting to repair and, and fix some of those uh, connections that were missing. How how long ago did he get this? It's several years ago. So it's uh, wow. about, it, it, it's they in the discussion. I think they say it's something like over three years or or so. That's but, amazing. Well, and I love that it's it's already a small enough processor that it's a backpack. And if right. this if this continues and and they continue to develop it, it'll be a bracelet, and then it'll be a necklace, and then it'll be like a lapel pin. And you'll be like good to go, right? It's gonna keep I'm getting smaller go. and or it's yeah, completely implantable, right? Mm -hmm. You have you don't yeah. need a backpack, you've just got you know something that's just you know a tattoo in your skin or just you know under right. the skin. Yeah. yeah, just inject a little a little pill shaped thing and you're good to go. This I love this. This this it's is amazing. This is a really smart connection of a bunch of different kind of science that's been happening all at once. This is the perfect concert of bringing them together for a real improvement in somebody's life. And I love that this isn't even just, we tried it and it worked. It's this person's life has been improved for over yes. several years. And it's getting that's and amazing. His, his, yeah. His autonomy is improving, increasing. Yeah. It's yeah. Life is getting better. You know, who knows if it, if the lesion in his spinal cord will ever be completely healed or, you know, get to that point. But this is an amazing part of that. And there's definitely within the nervous system, we know there's this mount mantra in, in neuroscience is use it or lose it. And yeah. there's also feedback loops. So if you are unable to use something, there is atrophy. Right. But if you're able to use it, then the feedback loop becomes positive then. And so maybe that will help the healing. Yeah, absolutely. That makes nothing but sense is you get to keep the the muscles moving. You're not to mention you might be building new pathways in your brain to figure out how to get around certain issues that that are that are preventing you from being able to ambulate normally. That's <laughs> oh my goodness. I know. It's very cool. Yeah, so I, I wasn't originally going to talk about this story, but I uh, took a deeper look into the study, which is available uh, through Nature, and it's it's an incredible advance, all the stuff that they're doing. Um, and like you said, where is it going to go from here? How many people is this going to work for? Um, I mean, I guess the question is also, you know, who's going to be at the place where they're like, yes, put things in my head, you know, <laughs> you know, cut a hole in my, in my skull and put implants in my brain and make it work. Um, well, so. not, not everybody who has hearing loss or, um, has, has been born without hearing wants a cochlear implant, but like having them available is yeah. still a huge improve improvement on, on quality of life for people who want to have that procedure. So, it's, yep. You're right. It's not everybody's going to want it, but 
particularly if somebody gets injured later in life and and has has a harder time adjusting to a new lifestyle i think it might it might be very attractive <laughs> and it's just it's just amazing to me that we know enough at this point in time to be able to put the electrodes in the correct place in the spinal cord and just be able to go okay your brain thought this we're just going to send that information yes. to the spinal cord right now and make that work. I love it. Here oh, you go. Man. So cool. Yeah. Next stop, robot legs, right? Yeah. And so this, you know, additionally, this is not just uh, the, the paper in nature is walking naturally after spinal cord injury using a brain, brain spine interface. You know, there's also, yeah, robot legs, brain spine interface. We can add more legs or maybe we can... <laughs> Add superpowers to your legs. Oh or... my God. <laughs> well, actually, this is just basically the Iron Man suit, right? Like it's just except it's... you know, it doesn't have the the, the nuclear no, no, power. I mean, I mean it isn't, yeah. it isn't. I guess it's more it's sorry, to to attach it to the appropriate um comic book thing. I guess right. it is more like Dr. Octavius's extra arms. That's more what it's more like, like it. Because that's yeah. It is spine and it's taking his thoughts and, and moving the arms. So it's, it's more similar to that, but yeah, it's, and it's why it, I mean, they put a thing in the brain, but then it's wireless and then the backpack and then they're like, Oh, electrodes in the spine. And I, I don't know this whole thing. But is, Yeah. That means if you had limb loss and you could take brain waves and then you just need to create it's it's very close to to having a uh, real time response from from artificial limbs as well. I think yeah. it's 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 parallel, but it's it, I think it's going to help inform that kind of research as well. I mean, I mean, just not just recovery from paralyzation or spinal injury, but maybe this will help additionally with limb loss maybe mm -hmm. it will like you said maybe this is gonna be maybe we can take it further it's just you know the plasticity of the brain is mm -hmm. uh, it's, it's extreme it can go places it can take us places which i think is cool oh and like i mentioned like very very briefly right before the show actually started um hypoxia if you Blair, yes. want to inhale less oxygen, maybe it'll be good for you. Well, I mean, it's good for mice, possibly. Anyway. I'm not going to do it now because I have a passenger that I need to send oxygen to. So I'm going to I'm going to wait, <laughs> wait to figure this out. But tell me about it. Yep. Publishing in PLOS Biology researchers used a mouse model of accelerated aging and, uh, well, they... <laughs> <laughs> they gave them less oxygen. So instead of like, uh, instead of ca caloric restriction, it was oxygen restriction. And oxygen restriction seemed to help their brains. They don't know why. They're, the mechanisms are completely unknown. But oxygen restriction led to extended lifespan in these aging accelerated mice. So then people in Denver should be living longer. And oxygen bars are bad for you. Is it <laughs> very? This, this is these are this, Yes, it's very interesting conclusions um, or related ideas. But uh, yeah, there is a suggestion from some data that there is less metabolic disease, uh, diabetes, and cardiovascular, cardiopulmonary vascular disease, COPV uh, disease in higher altitudes and maybe some of this is related to the oxygen levels who but i don't know there are also other drawbacks higher suicide rates i don't know there, things are very don't go restricting your oxygen just yet mm -mm. folks no thanks no That's, i'm gonna wasn't that the whole thing about covid that was like causing real <laughs> lasting problems to people oh, who had no, real bad covid right was yep. was oxygen deprivation so I'm no, I'm good. <laughs> yeah. Just stick with your oxygen the way that it's given to you. And, you know, I don't know. I'm going to wait for that 40 hertz spa. It won't hurt. <laughs> Have we done it? We've done it. 
Okay, we come to the end of our stories. Mm -hmm. We did it. We did it. We did it. We did it. All right. Oh, I got the hiccups just in time. <laughs> it was perfectly timed. Everyone, thank you so much for joining us for another episode of This Week in Science. We hope that you enjoyed the show. I need to thank very special people for all of their help. Thank you for everyone in the chat rooms, for being here in the chat rooms, you know, keeping up with us while we were talking about things and making comments and giving us your thoughts. We really appreciate you in the chat. Additionally, Fada, thank you so much for all of your work on social media and show notes. Identity4, thank you for recording the show. Gord, Arnlor, others, thank you for helping make those chat rooms happy places to be. And Rachel, thank you for editing the show. Additionally, I cannot go on without specifically saying thank you to our Patreon sponsors. Thank you to those of you who make Twist possible. Craig Potts, Mary Gertz, Teresa Smith, Richard Badge, Kent Northcote, Rich Loveman, Rick Loveman, George Chorus, Pierre Velazarb, John Ratnaswamy, Carl Kornfeld, Chris Wozniak, Vagard Chefstead, Hal Snyder, Donathan Stiles, aka Don Stylo, Ali Coffin, Reagan, Don Mundus, Stephen Alberon, Daryl Myshak, Stu Pollock, Andrew Swanson, Fredos 104, Sky Luke, Paul Ronovich, Kevin Reardon, Noodles Jack, Brian Carrington, David E. Youngblood, Sean Clarence, Lamb, John McKee, Greg Riley, Mark Hassan Plow, Steve Leesman, aka Zima, Ken Hayes, Howard Tan. Christopher Rapin, Richard, Brendan Minish, Johnny Gridley, Chemi Day, Flying Out, Christopher Dreyer, Artyom, Greg Briggs, John Atwood, Rudy Garcia, Dave Wilkinson, Rodney Lewis, Paul Rick, Ramis, Kurt Larson, Craig Landon, Sue Doster, Jason Olds, Dave Neighbor, Eric Knapp, E.O., Adam Mishkan, Eric, Kevin Parachan, Aaron Luthen, Steve DeBell, Bob Caldery, Marjorie, Paul D. Disney, David Simmerly, Patrick Pecoraro, and Tony Steele. Thank you for all of your support on Patreon. And if you are interested in supporting us on Patreon and we didn't read your list, your name here, head over to twist.org and click on the Patreon link and go from there. On next week's show, we will be back on Wednesday, 8 p.m. Pacific time, broadcasting live from Twitch, YouTube, and Facebook. And you can find more information at twist.org slash live. Want to listen to us as a podcast? Perhaps while well, you sit on a giant speaker and feel the vibrations. Search for This Week in Science where podcasts are found. If you enjoyed the show, get your friends to subscribe as well. And for more information on anything you've heard here today, show notes and links to stories are going to be available, like I said, at our website, twist.org, and you can sign up for our newsletter. You can also contact us directly, email Kiki at Kirsten at ThisWeekInScience.com, Justin at TwistMinion at gmail.com, or me, Blair, at BlairBaz at Twist.org. Just be sure to put Twist, T-W-I-S, in the sort of line, or your email will be spam filtered into the rings of Saturn, which we all know will dissipate over the next hundred million years or so. So we're, we're not going to we're not going to get to it in that amount of time. So just... Have you, seen, the have you Thank seen you. my inbox? Yeah, no, I'm not <laughs> going to get to it. You can also ping us on the Twitters where we are at Twist Science, at Dr. Kiki, at Jas Jackson Fly, and at Blair's Menagerie. And when we say Twitter, we also mean things like Instagram and Twitch and yeah, Facebook yes. and all of other places. We'd love your feedback. If there's a topic for a subject or anything you want us to cover or address, suggestion for an interview, let us know. We'll be back, we'll, we'll be back here next week, and we hope you'll join us again for more great science news. And if you've learned anything from the show, Remember, it's all in your head. <laughs>
Cause it's This Week in Science This Week in Science This Week in Science Science Science, science. science. This Week in Science This Week in Science This Week in Science 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 Science, science. I've got one disclaimer and it shouldn't be news That what I say may not represent your Doodle do, doodle do, doodle do, and we're in the after show. Just under a tight ninety. Just under. Just under. <laughs> I think Fada's very excited about this. Yes, in our in our uh, Discord, we did it. We actually did it. Good job, Blair. Oh, you know, couldn't have done it without hiccups, kicks. Oh boy, <laughs> it's getting. I'm just, God, I'm I'm panting when I talk now. <laughs> it's so you fun. can't inhale completely. Mm-mm, like mm-mm. there's something in the way down there. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Can't wait to meet him. He'll be here in no time. I know. No, no, so soon. We have to talk Actually about in the end game here. <laughs> I don't know. It's it's probably time we have a sit down and a conversation for like what know, happens in August? Yeah. <laughs> or even earlier, we don't know. Earlier yeah. later. We uh, Yeah, it's probably getting up to like the uh we should talk about this yeah. stage. Yeah, so, we probably should. I mean, it's end of May. Yeah. Yeah. I uh, don't have to talk about it right now. <laughs> no. I do have a uh, camera. Eight, eight more weeks of work and then I'm 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 stopping my day job at that point. So awesome. So we'll see. Cool. So yeah. are do you do you have a good maternity leave? Yeah, it's not bad. No. Yeah. I mean, two, so two first of all, or... California's uh got some some fairly good stuff. Um, okay. But so you technically get six weeks before your due date. Um, but I think I would go insane. So I'm taking three. Yeah. <laughs> I think three is enough. Unless um, things also, happen like, and you have to go earlier, but yeah, whatever. Yeah. Yeah. It's three is enough where it's like, if, if he's a couple weeks early, then I'll still be out, which is good. I really don't want to go into labor at work. Um, and uh nope it's also not too long where that's the other thing is like i don't want to just sit on a couch and so it's it is it's gonna force me to move around and do stuff and talk to people and and stuff to a certain point right so i want to kind of keep doing that lots as long long as i can um luckily i have a dog who requires me to go on walks every day so i'm getting my walks in you're being safety we gotta go for another walk yeah (laughs) Yeah. <laughs> more and more walking well yeah. i'm sure that justin probably uh his his missing being here is probably something that was passed along due to children yes yeah probably. <laughs> daycare programs and whatnot yeah but oh the joys you are in for i know so many good things coming yes. But actually, yes, I'm very yes! excited. <laughs> it's going to be great. Yeah. I've already read two books. I'm on to book three. So I'm trying to learn things. Um, just book- like, you know, when I when I got married, I had to start from the beginning because I wasn't someone who had been planning Gotten my wedding married. since I was a kid, right? Like Gotten some married people before. know all the things because <laughs> they've been planning it forever or they they were uh, made of honor before and they've been through all the things and I, I didn't know any of the things. And similarly, like I knew I probably wanted kids, but I wasn't like someone who babysat a bunch as a child. I didn't, I wasn't around a lot of babies growing up. And I also just like hadn't really thought about it because I it was never a sure thing. So, so I wasn't putting too much mental space or effort into learning these things. And then mm-hmm. I, it became a reality. And I was like, oh, I guess I have to learn these things now. You'll learn as you go. 
Yeah, oh yeah. And it continues to be a learning experience and the books yeah. are awesome. And it's because it's, you know, experience from other people. But yeah. in the end, you just have to do what you know is right and yeah. get help from other people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Never Absolutely. think you're alone. Well, and uh, literally billions of people have done this before. So yes, they've gotten through it. Um, I did appreciate, I will put a personal plug out there for anyone else who may be looking for books about having babies um, in the future. This book called Expecting Better, which I guess is pretty famous, but it's it's basically like okay, let's talk about all the things that doctors tell you and your friends and families tell you and midwives tell you and all these things. And let's and look then. at data. Awesome. Let's dive into the actual research. Oh, they tell you you can't drink coffee when you're pregnant. The only research was done on like eight cups a day. <laughs> and there's also like all these, uh, all this pressure on not gaining too much weight when you're pregnant. But statistically speaking, a baby is more likely to have negative outcomes if you gain too little weight than gain too right. much weight. Right. Um, in the end, there's all sorts of like neurological and spinal issues that can happen if you don't gain enough. The worst thing that can happen if you gain too much weight is that your baby is statistically more likely to be obese as an adult. But that's it. So it's it's something. It's certainly something, but it's nothing, nothing not. as bad as being underweight. So for yeah. all of the pressure that gets put on you to not gain too much weight, it should actually be like the other way around. But it's, you know, whatever. <laughs> it should be just be healthy. Yeah. Be healthy. Yeah, and it looks yeah. different for everybody. Like and that's for me, different for everyone. Yeah, That meant I had to basically only eat white bread for the first 16 weeks of my pregnancy. <laughs> but it ended up working out. It was fine. Forti fortified white bread, I'm sure. <laughs> I ate some pasta. Also, I ate a lot of applesauce. I survived off of applesauce. It kept me going. Whatever. I mean, yeah, you think yeah. they're like, oh, sometimes it's like, don't gain any weight. You're like, how can I? I can't keep anything down. <laughs> no. <sighs> Yes, I did not know, for example, that uh, there was this thing called hyperemesis where, um, hey, everybody listening <laughs> and watching, did you know that uh, there's morning sickness and all, which is just like, oh, I don't feel good. Maybe I barf once. Um, there's this thing called hyperemesis, which you don't stop barfing all day, every day. <laughs> you barf three to five times a day, every day. For weeks, two months. <laughs> that was wild. I didn't know that was a thing that could happen to you. It's like 3% of people, but I got to be... Uh, and you were one of those 3%. Lucky lottery ticket winner there. But yeah, I mean, like the media is just the worst with uh, how pregnancy is portrayed, right? They're just like, oh, you wake up, bleh, I barfed. Oh, I'm good now. I'm good for my day. <laughs> that was not my... I think the biggest thing, yeah, stay off the internet. Don't go to the internet for advice. No. Even just like TVs and movies too, like TVs. TV and movies. The TVs. Oh, those TVs. Um, all of them. The way they uh the way they portray pregnancy is uh yeah. I mean I, I could have guessed it was wrong, but I couldn't have guessed how it was wrong. Um and so I so many ways. I learned in lots of ways. Yes. There's so many ways. Yeah. There's I mean, the problem is, yeah, there is the generalization, which is generalized to like a, a very specific bias, cultural bias, mm -hmm. and then it ignores a whole bunch of other things that people and ways of being and ways of experiencing and and the science. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's... I mean, it's very interesting to learn, like, one study from 1965 and you're not allowed to take a particular drug while you're pregnant ever again, right? Just Some stuff of those, like that. Yeah. <laughs> Some of those studies were very good. And we, and we think, yeah. you know, it's, it's good we don't take certain drugs during pregnancy, but yes. at the same time, yeah. There's others that don't matter. And especially um, what I ended up taking for 
my uh, vomiting and nausea was something that the two pieces of it, which is um, Unisom and uh, B6, hmm. are okay to take while pregnant. But this drug called Benedictin from this one study no. was uh, basically forbidden by the FDA to be taken while, while in pregnancy. But all it is is those two things. <laughs> Together. Yeah. And it was this one study that uh, had a bunch of confounding variables um, that then in the end they pulled it. But these two other ones, when taken separately, there's a huge mass of scientific evidence that proves that it's fine. Mm -hmm. So th then it's, yeah. <laughs> it's very funny that it just got pulled from the market, but doctors still prescribe the two pieces. Because they know it works. And yes. Yes. So um, the other thing that was funny about coffee that I thought was wild was, so most of the studies are eight cups or more, but also um, the problem is it's mostly in early pregnancy when if you're, if you have more nausea, you are statistically less likely to miscarry because you have higher hormone levels, which are causing the nausea. Therefore, the pregnancy is proving more successful. Therefore, you are more nauseous. Therefore, you are less likely to miscarry. Like it's this whole, they're, they're, they're connected, right? Tied together, yeah. If you're nauseous, you're less likely to drink coffee. That's very true. So yeah. these confounding variables mean that they associated less coffee drinking anecdotally with lower miscarriage rates. But then when you actually do studies on caffeine intake introduced yeah. into mice, for example, you have to like crank people, up so but... high, nobody's yeah. drinking that much coffee. <laughs> it's like, uh, it's, it's very, you common. hope that's like, yeah, you, know, you hope a pot and a half. I like don't you're know. taking it to the vein. <laughs> basically. Too much coffee. Pick up the Mr. Coffee directly. That much coffee would make you nauseous just oh on its own. Oh my god! Own. That much coffee would make you like vibrate at forty hertz. <laughs> yes. <laughs> oh man. Whoa, whoa, whoa! Anyway, so yeah, so that book was really cool because she was basically like, "Let's look at what's statistically accurate and what is statistically inaccurate. What is based on an Love old it. study that has nothing? What is based on current studies that make sense?" It was very cool. That's awesome. Um, and in the end, she kind of just was like, here's what the data says. Um, make your own decision. <laughs> so pretty wild. Pretty wild. I, I, I love a... I love love when you can get the actual stats. That's like yeah, what I, I was always, that I would always book, my doctor. It wasn't for. available for me. And yeah, the not all doctors have that stuff. Yeah. So no, no. Yeah. Yeah, it's pretty cool. And um, she also had like a guide on how to um, how to talk to your doctor about this kind of stuff That's because they'll cool. they'll tell you these kind of blanket statements, right? Yeah. For example, uh, they might tell you that um, when you're late in in pregnancy, that uh, you need to be induced because your amniotic fluid is low. Um, but if you chug a bunch of water before you go, it actually might be fine. <laughs> It's like, oh, that's what? really good to know, actually, because I usually try to not drink too much water before I go into an ultrasound because you're getting poked in the bladder by a blunt object. You have to so, yeah. 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 <laughs> um, uh, yeah, it was pretty interesting. I don't know. Man, I wish I'd had that book. I didn't have that book. Yeah. It's, I just it had the internet. My friend. It was so good. Yeah, and the internet's a scary place for advice. <laughs> so scary. Except for here. Yeah, that's true. We do our and best. Yeah, we do. And you're you're helping people, telling them about this book. Yeah, it's so Expecting good. Expecting better. Expecting better. Yeah. Um, I, I think my child came down here, and I think I need to help him do something. He's acting okay. strange. This is what you get with um, 12-year-olds. I can't wait. <laughs> I know. It's, I know, like... 
Um, I feel like the stereotypical thing is that people are really excited for babies and toddlers and young children. And then they're like, oh God, they're going to be teenagers one day. And all of my experience with kids, my it's professional older, experience is with teenagers. And so yeah. I'm like, I don't know what I'm going to do with this potato, but I can't wait to meet the teenager. <laughs> Lay a good foundation with that potato. Oh, yeah. I can't yeah. wait. He's going to be that so little, the little um, Yes, spud. go see to your 12-year-old potato and I will go see to mine. <laughs> I hear scary noises. So oh, no. Yeah, I need to go. <laughs> okay. Uh, all right. Say goodnight, Kiki. Oh, yeah. Good night, Kiki. Say goodnight, Blair. Good night, Blair. Good night, night everyone. everyone. Thank you all for joining us. Stay curious about the noises that are coming from down here that my child is causing and stay healthy, safe, and we'll see you all soon. Next week, hopefully. Yeah. Hopefully. <laughs>